Thank you so much. Um, it's been really, it was really interesting, I think, to think about this talk in context to everything that we've heard today and yesterday. Um, we'll be talking about kind of a work in progress for our community, uh, thinking about maintenance in different ways, specifically as it applies to the Turing Way project. A little bit about us, first and foremost. Um, I'm Anne, I'm the community manager of the project based at the Allen Turing Institute, um, but I'm also an ethnographer by, by training. And I'm Danny Garside. I'm an infrastructure co-lead on the project in a volunteer capacity. And my day job is as a computational neuroscientist. Cool. So we'll walk through a little bit more about what the Turing Way is. Um, we'll kind of zoom through sort of different ways in which we think through maintenance over the course of the next couple of minutes. And it's important to note here that while it's the two of us speaking, uh, as contributors and maintainers of the project, we mu very much like, represent a much larger community of folks who maintain the Turing Way. So you might be wondering, what is the Turing Way in the first place? Um, we're an open guide, a documentation project for data science and open research. We're available open access. We draw upon a lot of open source tools and ways of working. We document open tools, open data, open hardware, and open software, and really aim to facilitate a kind of open culture as well. And while we are based at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI, um, we are not exclusive to. We're hosted by and receive resources from, but the Turing Way really wouldn't be what it is without a global community of folks that contribute to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So kind of going back to the beginning of the project, um, it really emerged in response to the crisis of reproducibility in science, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, many scientific studies cannot be re reproduced or replicated, and this process was especially associated with some, um, with the field of psychology, um, but is pervasive across many other scientific fields. Uh, and we see a similar crisis of reproducibility in data science more largely in the fields of emerging AI. And the upside of this is that it it very much fueled the open science movement in response to it. Um, and it was kind of in this spirit that the Turing Way was created. So Dr. Kirstie Whitaker, who leads the Tools, Practices, and Systems program at the Turing, uh, she, was, she gathered together a group of allies and, and folks in similar fields. She is a neuroscientist by training, um, gathered them together to create the Guide for Reproducible Research in 2018. But then it was with the addition of Dr. Malvika Sharon, who is um, a life scientist, with the addition of her, we realized that we couldn't really think about reproducibility um, in science and in research without thinking about kind of all different aspects related to research. So the Guide for Reproducibility became another guide for project design, for communication, for collaboration, for ethical research, as well as a series of meta-documentation practices that we use within our open source community that others can use as well. And while we keep saying, while we're saying best practices, it's really a process of creating guidance together. There is no, kind of no one way of doing research. The way is a journey, not a set of rules. And very much a work in progress. Um, have seen a lot of growth over the past number of years um, through this kind of open way of working, over 400 folks contributing on GitHub, thousands of users. Um, and if there's something we also want to plug here, it's that all of the images that you're seeing in this presentation are things that you can use for your own work, your own presentations. They're all available on Zenodo. Feel free to use them. But the more that we, we realized that the Turing Way was... Um, was growing and involving more and more folks from all sorts of different backgrounds, the more we tended to use this kind of garden metaphor to describe the Turing Way as something we wanted to tend to, like a commons, um, as we saw it kind of increase in size and in scope. And this growth accompanied its kind of broader influence in policy and industry environments within the UK, um, from the energy sector to health data um, to different open spaces and research spaces. But beyond the UK, we also saw it expand to become a global um, audience, to include a global community. It has been accessed in almost every country in the world, um, save for a few. And with this comes a, a different kind of sense of responsibility in co-creating a kind of knowledge commons to document the culture of research and data science. Who are we actually serving as a resource based in the UK, um, but expanding much larger to the, to the broader kind of global community of data scientists and, and folks who work with data more broadly. Um, and again, coming back to this, these natural metaphors, we really were increasingly thinking, what does a global community garden uh, look like for a project like the Turing Way? 
And we really drew upon a lot of the ideas associated with that of a knowledge commons. You might have heard of the crisis of the commons, right? The idea that a, a common resource is kind of doomed to fail due to overpopulation, overuse, um, if people are not limited in the way that they might use that resource. Um, Eleanor Ostrom really pushed back against this idea and said the, the crisis of the commons is actually more a crisis of governing the folks who use that commons. It's a crisis of open access without any sort of limitations. And that really has influenced how we as a community are trying to address these questions of sustainability more broadly um, because we want to ensure that this knowledge commons can be open and accessible for all. But in order to create a commons um, and not succumb to that crisis requires changing research culture. And there are a couple ways in which we're aiming and trying to do this, which I'll talk about a few here. Um, one is aiming to support the kind of localization of data science as we know it, um, the, the um, translation and localization team, which emerged uh, naturally through a group of volunteers within the community, has started the translation process of the Turing Way into Spanish, French, Turkish, Japanese, um, I believe Portuguese as well, and most recently, I believe that there's maybe two or three teams that are going to be activated in the next number of months. Because really what they saw was that sometimes the language of open science and data science doesn't necessarily exist outside of, for example, the Anglophone-dominated sphere of um, computer programming. And this ultimately aims to make these resources locally relevant, accessible for a global audience. And just plugging that Batul um, Armazouk, who is actually one of the co-leads of the translation and localization team, is actually speaking right now in the online room about the process of increasing accessibility for right-to-left languages. Another way in which we're aiming to kind of shift the culture of research more broadly is by really focusing on how can we recognize all kinds of roles within the research field more broadly. Uh, the term research infrastructure roles you might have heard of as a term to describe kind of all sorts of roles and types of work that contribute to research, really kind of pushing back and going beyond that of a primary investigator of a project. You think of librarians, data stewards, community managers such as myself, research software engineers, kind of all of these different roles that contribute to the process through which research occurs, but may not necessarily have a name or title that kind of correspond to the type of work that they're, going to, that they're doing within the project, and may not necessarily be recognized as researchers as such. And a couple of folks from the community, including Danny, who will be speaking more later, um, recently uh, published a preprint for a manifesto for rewarding and recognizing team infrastructure roles. Um, and we're really excited to see how we can kind of support more and more of that work. And finally, of course, perhaps most relevant for the FOSFAC stage uh, community is the notion that we're really, again, trying to practice open collaboration in real time. And this means using and supporting open source infrastructure, but also recognizing non-code contributions within an open source ecosystem. Uh, really, here we'll plug the All Contributors bot, uh, which we have installed within our repository, which really aims to recognize kind of all sorts of different roles that are associated with the project that go beyond um, the GitHub-related ones or the code-related ones. But again, kind of going back to the notion of this community garden, of this global commons, um, what is required to maintain it? Um, and what, what else have we done in order to enable that maintenance? Um, one is kind of a work in progress. Uh, our emerging governance structure is really aimed to make this implicit process explicit. Uh, we've been, over the course of the past year, really tried to understand you know, what topics are already being talked about, what types of work are already being done within the community, how can we identify that type of work, that topic, and make it more explicit so that others can join within that process. I'm really kind of drawing up upon the idea of the tyranny of structurelessness, right? That work must be made explicit um, in order to be made more open for others to access. Um, working groups are being formalized currently, in, which includes the translation and localization team, which was formalized in the past year. Um, the infrastructure maintainers group has also been formalized in the past year. Danny will talk a little bit more about. And we also have emerging interest groups that may include, for example, the research infrastructure roles idea um, that I had spoken about previously. 
And there's also in process a kind of notion of creating an intergenerational steering group that includes folks from previous generations or iterations of the Turing Way so they can be involved in kind of every kind of evolutionary step of the community and of the project in order to ensure that we're not getting too far away from our roots, but also are able to address these questions of how do we speak to a global community? Um, how can we serve their needs? Just another visualization of what that looks like in real time, uh, another of other examples shared here. And again, really trying to create shared spaces and collaborations so that we don't really reinvent the wheel. And of course, I think you all are familiar with um, the XKCD um, image here. Uh, First and foremost, I think one of the key questions that has come out of this formalization process um, is really coming back to this answer of, well, so much of open source, so much of open labor relies upon free labor. And open source projects such as the Turing Way are primarily run and maintained by volunteers, and we really want to change this culture. We are, in, we are you know, a part of an institution, we receive support from an institution, but how can we you know, funnel that support outwards to support maintainers? And that is an ongoing question that we've heard many talks over the past uh, couple days that really have tried to address this question as well. And we really want to participate in that conversation. So, of course, ongoing questions. How do we support people monetarily? How do we support maintainers? Uh, monetarily. We have an emerging kind of combination of paid staff within the Turing Institute, but also unpaid volunteers who work on the project. Um, what that dynamic looks like in terms of governance, we are very much in the process of working out. would love to discuss with anyone who's currently understanding and thinking through those complex dynamics and questions. But the follow-up question from that is, you know, how do we gather more funding? What does funding look like in order to support this kind of work? to make sure that is prioritized, because maintenance work is not necessarily kind of a part of traditional funding structures. Um, we do have emerging projects with mentor-based internship, like GSOC, GDOC, Outreachy, but there's also a space for folks that may be mid-career or past the internship stage that are looking for um, more ex paid experience within the open source space. Um, that the idea that was talked about yesterday of having an open source sabbatical is again a really interesting one. It sounds like there's a lot of there is a lot of collective brainstorming happening here. Um, but finally, these two questions really kind of play into a, a broader one um, that within the open source, within, within any open source more broadly, is the notion of balancing the creation of, of chapters, the creation of documentation within the Turing way, and the kind of broader notion of the need for maintenance of it, because creation ultimately can lead to or feed into maintenance. Um, how can we balance this creation of chapters, which is the primary way in which the Turing way has developed as a project, with the recognition of different types of contributions within the project in the first place, which includes translation, which includes infrastructure maintenance, which includes kind of all different types of work. And of course, how can we talk about any of those things without talking about the broader social context in which um, open source and open research and open science exist more broadly? Um, in the UK especially, um, there's a, an emer there's a movement, ongoing strikes, uh, that aim to protect and enable better working conditions for graduate students, for university staff, alongside other um, discussions around, you know, who is prioritized as academic support staff, um, what working conditions are required in order to enable better work. So, again, gardening, digital gardening with the Turing Way requires a lot of paradigm shifts, a, way, a lot of different ways of thinking and working, and prioritizing, redirecting funding. Um, but I'm not going to be the one speaking about that because I'll pass the mic on to a digital gardener of the Turing Way, uh, Danny. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for involving me in this presentation. Um, so I've been involved in the Turing Way since fairly near the beginning. I, I hadn't realized until we were pulling together this presentation, but I've been involved for um, four years or so now. And I found the project when I was a PhD student learning how to do science, not really liking what I was learning. And um, I was heavily involved in the open science community on Twitter at the time. And um, it was really energized by the fact that there were people that were trying to change science for the better. And so when I found out about the Turing Way, I was, it was a fantastic resource to read about these um, developing subjects. And then I spotted a typo. And I was like, ooh, it says that I can contribute. And so I opened my first pull request. And it would take me a couple of years to realize that actually 
there was this uh, hidden agenda of the Turing way that it wasn't, you weren't meant to just read about the subjects in the book, you were meant to learn by doing as well. So the project is run as an open source project. So you, um, you create forks, you create branches, you do pull requests, they're reviewed, they're merged, and there's lots of emojis. It's great. Um, So one of the things that has, um, that has changed for me over the couple of years since I've been involved is that I have moved from um, just fixing typos to, um, to having a larger impact on the infrastructure more generally. And as part of the formalization process that has been ongoing for the last year or so, I've been christened with this title of infrastructure co-lead. And that was very nice. That was. Um, Importantly, that came after the other folks who were involved in the project asking me how I would like my contributions to be recognized. And I think that is um, possibly a step that is skipped sometimes. And that was, it was really nice to be asked. That is what I, I needed at the time for, for my CV to make the, um, make the progress professionally that I, need, that I wanted to make. Um, now that I've been involved for a few years, I can, um, instead of fixing typos myself, if I see something that is um, easily fixed and not causing too much damage, I now have the opportunity to involve other people and use that as a learning opportunity and an onboarding opportunity for other people. And so now instead of fixing things, I flag things as good first issue. So that when we have a, a book dash or if somebody just stumbles across the project, they can see how they might get involved and go through the process with something that, to be honest, I've already checked and I can see that it should be, should be easily fixed so that they have a, a nice, nice smooth onboarding process. And I think that's really important. And I think that's something that our project actually does really well. Um, one of the other things that I've been working on recently is improving our CI and this was a little bit like um, running after a moving train, because in order to implement that properly, we needed to get to a stage where um, the website was being built without any errors. And uh, there was quite a backlog of errors. So um, we finally managed to get through all of these kind of little niggling things. And now we're at a lovely stage where, as people are working on different independent chapters, we can see in advance whether those chapters would fail CI and jump in and fix problems before they become problems, um, which is great. That um, requires a lot less archaeology. Um, so we've mentioned Jupyter Book a couple of times. This is the, the package that we use to, um, to build our website, to build our book. And it takes markdown files and it creates HTML. And it does so in a way that means we can have interactive visualizations and code chunks and all fancy lovely things like that. And one of the things that we're trying to do um, more so at the moment is be a, a good example of how to use JupyterBook. We want, to, uh, we want JupyterBook to be able to hold us up as an example and say, hey, look at this cool thing that you can do with, with us. And part of that includes being at the cutting edge of their development and also trying to um, contribute upstream to that project where we can, and even further upstream to the project that projects that they rely on. Um, and that is something that we'd really like to do more of, and we're trying to work out how to support the people that are involved in the Turing Way currently to, to do that and to build those connections with the upstream projects. Another thing that we've been working on recently um, is uh, reducing the bus factor, which is a term that I didn't know before this conference. Thank you, folks. Um, by, by writing about what we do. So the book currently has um, lots of lovely things like introductions to Git, how to organize an accessible conference. But we don't really have much of the, um, or we could do with more of the, how do we do what we do? How do we build the book itself? What? steps do you need to follow if you wanted to reproduce our work? Um, and that is something that is a work in progress currently, but um, that's yeah going really well. Really excited about that. Another upstream contribution that we're trying to make is to this all contributors bot. And 
Um, I really can't uh, shout enough about all contributors. It is a really lovely way to recognize all of the different types of contribution that our project receives, whether that be fixing bugs, or writing, or editing, or coming up with ideas, providing review. It means that people can be recognized for these different types of contribution, and it provides a, a nice, sleek system where we can do that without having to manually keep track of all of these things. I recommend checking it out if this is something that you would benefit from. One of the other groups that Anne mentioned briefly was the translation and localization team. Um, at the moment, they're using a platform called Crowdin to translate the book into um, these various languages. And they're also working alongside the carpentries so that um, the translation methodology that they're using is they can learn from each other. That's really exciting, and that's really going to extend, hopefully, our impact around the world. Another group that has formed, again, of this, um, uh, this formalization process in the last year is a working group on reviewing and editing. Um, and they've been looking at uh, the fairly large backlog of old and stale issues that the project has accumulated over time. Um, this is great because it means that new, new people who come to the project see a, a cleaner project. They see um, less kind of, um, yeah, less stale projects, less stale issues when they join the project. One of the things that we try to do across the project is not reinvent the wheel, to rely on and support other projects that are doing things that are valuable to us. Um, one that we want to highlight is the Software Freedom Conservancy. We use infrastructure to, um, to run live notes um, through them. And we also have links with all of these other organizations to, to support them and, in exchange, be supported by them. One of the things that we always want to keep in mind is meeting folks where they are. So people will come to the project with very different interests and skill levels. And I think that's, again, something that we do quite well. We have these book dashes where folks are invited to join us, and people come along with ideas of chapters that they want to write or tools that they want to build into the book itself. Um, and we have the support system in place to, to meet those people where they are, which is great. Now, the standard way that people contribute to the book is by, is by writing chapters. They come to the book and say, hey, my area of expertise is in um, pre-registration, and there isn't a section on pre-registration. I'm going to write one. That'll be cool. Um, there's a group of us who um, hang around in the background trying to make, make it easy for people to make those contributions, but maybe not actually making those contributions ourselves. And we are the infrastructure maintainers. And this is the kind of antithesis of what is rewarded in science and um, code development, because it is the, um, the long-term, behind-the-scenes, not glamorous, and not necessarily novel um, work. And this is something that there's hopefully, I hope, a paradigm change in science and research at the moment to reward this type of work rather than it, um, it being invisible. So, um, the Turing Way is purposefully a very slow-moving um, slow project. Um, we've taken several years to get to this stage. We now have this beautiful um, beautiful selection of guides that help people around the world to do science in an ethical and reproducible way. We grew from this responsive, um, there's a crisis, let's do something about it mindset. And now we're at the stage of, well, how do we make sure that we are sustainable long term? What are our goals? How do we um, create structure so that, so that we can keep on going, keep on having impact? And one of the things that I think we really like to bear in mind is to move away from move fast and break things and move slowly and maintain things. I want to get that on a t-shirt. I like that a lot. 
Okay, with that, I want to say thanks to our community of contributors and users. Um, they didn't all fit on this slide, but thanks to all of them. And I will hand back to Anne to do a few plugs for upcoming events. Yes, I have the honor of ending this talk with some obligatory plugs. Um, we have community events that we run on, at an online first way throughout the, the month, throughout the week, throughout the year. Um, collaboration cafes happen on the first and third Wednesday. They're kind of a two hour event that you can drop by to learn more about the community, meet other folks online. I'll actually be hosting one tomorrow if you feel like seeing me online uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, translation, the translation and localization team runs meetings every two Tuesday evening, um, 5 p.m. UTC time. They're also really kind of a community within the community, um, and they're always looking for folks to join in on their efforts. Um, we will be running a fireside chat at the end of the month about community care during times of digital burnout, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and we also have a buy annual event called a book dash, which is kind of like a concentrated period of time that used to be focused on writing as much as possible within a week, but we're really aiming to pivot that kind of concentrated period of work into how can we bring together people intentionally to work on all different elements of the project, including maintenance. How can we kind of do the antithesis of a hackathon in a way, but during a hackathon kind of timeline? And you can learn more about these links and learn more about these events um, on our new welcome page, uh, with the link of which is here. A couple of small plugs, um, Fireside Chat, um, an event that we're running at Mozilla Fest with another emerging interest group around ethical AI, a very different side of the Turing way um, that we didn't talk about here, but is emerging from a kind of collaboration with the team at Big Science and, and Hugging Face to ask questions about how our data is used. Um, in different spaces in the AI pipeline. A couple of other plugs for citations and readings that really influence us as a community. Again, The Turing Way is a book, but it's also part of a larger library and a larger community of and ways of thinking as well. Some acknowledgments, some thanks. Again, thank you so much for listening to us, and I believe that is all from us about maintenance as a Turing Way. So thank you very much for that talk. It sounded really cool. So is, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Excellent citation slide. Big fan of that. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, all right, so I got two small questions just because I'm curious. So the first one is um, you talked a lot about uh, the research and the research process and kind of open communities within this process. For the Turing way, like where do you envision that boundary being drawn? Um, working in academia myself, there's always like, you know, there's researchers that aren't scientists, right? Or maybe they work in the humanities and stuff. And I'm curious, like this is something that we struggle with is figuring out like when we talk about open, what this is. And then my second question, sorry, uh, but my second question is you talk about culture change and this slow process of encouraging people. Um, and there have been mentions from other people at other talks around here about like, yeah, we, we gotta like build up advocacy and stuff and get people on this, but um, I've noticed there's other initiatives that are trying to force institutional change, right? So like in the US, changing how we evaluate uh, faculty on their research to not just be based on papers and uh, conferences. So those are my two questions. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe I could do the first, and I think you'd be good for the second. Sure. All right. Um, so regarding the first one, um, it's actually important to mention here that I'm, as a community manager, I'm an anthropologist. I don't have a PhD. Uh, Danny's a neuroscientist by training and does, and works in a classical academic environment. Um, and I, won't, I will say very honestly, it's a work in progress. As we've seen the Turing Way grow as a community and interestingly have kind of, incidentally or not because of people's interests that may or may not be academic. Um, for example, the, the hugging face for the big science team, which is a big collaboration within the AI world right now. It's kind of 
come over to the Turing Way to say hello because they don't have community spaces in which to ask these questions. Not all of them would necessarily associate themselves with academia. Alongside that, you have the community of people that have built the Turing Way that very, are very much grounded in open science um, and come from the crisis of reproducibility, have really advocated for the kind of institutional shifts that we're now seeing on an international level. Um, like the year of open science that was just initiated by the US government or the UNESCO call for best practices in open science. That builds on years of grassroots work at institutional levels um, really all across the world. And so I think the, the t not tension per se, but rather an ongoing question is, as we grow as a community, is, is there space for both of these people? Um, is there a place for a pluriverse, for both of those ideas where they can you know, collaborate, communicate with each other? Um, more cohesively. And that's the kind of space that we want to occupy as the project. And that means, you know, having much more of a networked leadership of which maybe I'm not necessarily as attuned to the academic open science side of things. Maybe I could assist in a different way. Danny might be a person that's very attuned to the academic, um, I guess the ongoing academic discussion within open science. How can he be a part of those conversations in a way that doesn't necessarily all come back to one person? Um, Hopefully that answers your question. I'm going to pass it to Danny. Um, so you asked about uh, recognizing contributions through not just publications and conference proceedings. Is that right? Yeah, like culture change from like trying to build a community and like, uh -huh. make friends versus culture change trying to actually like change organizational policy. You know, like telling people like we got to do things moving now. Uh -huh. What's the current way perspective? Okay, so I think the, um, I'll direct you to a, a paper that the, the community came together and wrote recently, this manifesto for, um, for research infrastructure roles. And um, I'll just highlight my favorite bit of that paper um, is talking about this um, fragmentation of research output. So rather than bundle everything up and get a sign of approval from a, um, uh, a prestige journal, um, what I hope we'll see in the future of science is um, data papers and review papers and analysis papers all separated out and all, instead of having authorship, having contributorship um, listed so that you can say, hey, I just did the stats on that paper. I'm responsible for that and I take responsibility for that. And when I'm applying for jobs, I can point to this and show I was the statistician on that. Please hire me as a statistician or however you want to do. I think having that fragmentation and specificity is going to be really important going forwards. Of course, I, I can't say um, I speak on behalf of everybody, but I'll just highlight that for you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much.